it's about that time. <clears throat> it's good to have everyone with us tonight. Uh, I hate to interrupt, but uh, they gave me the signal that it was time to go ahead and get started. So, um, as you notice, Keith is, is not with us, not back with us yet. Uh, hopefully, uh, I think this is the last night that... Uh, He'll be um, out of town at the lectureship, uh, or the last night of it, if I understood him correctly. Uh, but we do do miss him when he's gone. But uh, he had asked me to, to go ahead and fill in Wednesday night as well. So I appreciate uh, the opportunity to do that. Uh, before we begin, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Derek Rollerson, if he will, to lead us in opening prayer. So. Let us pray. Holy, heavenly, and gracious Father, we humbly bow before your great throne giving you thanks for this day. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the rain. We we know that you provide the rain to the just and the unjust. Heavenly Father, we realize that you provide us all things to get through this life, our food, our shelter, our jobs, our families. Heavenly Father, may we always be mindful that you have provided all things. Heavenly Father, we know that there is sickness physically in the world. Heavenly Father, we know members of the congregation suffer, suffer from physical ailments. Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with Haskell Kelly's family, be with Gen- Ginger, be with the children. Heavenly Father, may that family be comforted in knowing that Haskell was a faithful member of the church We'll, the Jacksonville congregation will miss him. Heavenly Father, be with them as they go through the next few days, the months, and the years. May they always lean upon thee for comfort in this time of need. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the country that we live in. We pray that all of our elected officials will seek after thee, will come to the truth, will lead this nation uh, unto thee. Heavenly Father, we realize that we have a part in that as well, to seek and save the lost, to preach the gospel, to present the truth, to be the light of the world. Heavenly Father, may we edify one another, build one another up through the programs, not just here at Jacksonville, but throughout the world. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the members here, the elders, deacons, the preachers, all of our speakers that we have forthcoming. Heavenly Father, be with us Friday night with our singing so we can <clears throat> praise Thee, glorify Thee in song. Be with the prime timers as they meet Thursday night. Be with all of the programs. May we edify one another, build one another up. Be with the speaker tonight. We ask that we pay attention. We appreciate him and his family. Be with us as we go through this day, through this life. We ask that all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you will turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9, and we're going to... be looking at this chapter tonight and, and hopefully taking some lessons from it. Uh, but as we begin, uh, as you're turning there, Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23 uh, tells us that, uh, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Uh, Jeremiah here is pointing out that mankind left to ourselves, uh, we, we would be in trouble, wouldn't we? Uh, if, if everything was left upon just what we know and our limited knowledge and, and our ability, uh, we'd be in trouble. Um, and as we think about that, we understand that there is help that we need. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 tells us the wages of sin, again, the help that we need to be able to come out of that of sin is, is not anything we can do of ourselves but it's uh, upon that of God and His mercy and kindness. And we're going to notice some, some lessons uh, or some things as we, we look at Second Samuel chapter 9. 
and, and make some application to that. And, and we see a good example uh, from this chapter uh, of what God does for man, what, what God does for us. Um, if, if you're familiar with 2 Samuel chapter 9, we're going to look at it in, in, in three blocks, if you will, as we take uh, beginning the first three verses, then uh, 4 through 8, and then the remainder of the chapter, and, and maybe make some, uh, some application uh, to some things that we can see uh, found here in these verses and apply those uh, to our life today. To begin with, as we look at 2 Samuel chapter 9, uh, we'll just read those first three verses as we begin. And, and like I said, we're going to get through the whole chapter. Uh, but here we see uh, where the Bible tells us, David said, Is there yet any that is left in the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul, that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame, on his feet. So here we, we see the beginning of this chapter. We, we see as it opens up, and, and we could go back and, and just kind of set the stage a little bit, I suppose. Uh, David at this time has finally uh, taken... The city of Jerusalem at this point, uh, he's, he's uh, on the throne there in Jerusalem and, and he's had some previous wars, some, some things that had taken place and it's almost as if he's at a point that he's reflecting maybe on how, you know, in, in my mind I could see it happening where he's reflecting on really how he got to where he's at. Um, and, and in that we see that he remembers Jonathan. And we know Jonathan was, was his close friend. Uh, we know uh, that they loved one another as brothers. Uh, they were very close, and you know Jonathan, in fact, saved his life. Um, he, he allowed David to be able to to escape uh, that of Saul, and that's when he began to be on the run. But this is much later after that. Certainly after Saul's death, um, after the death of Jonathan, um, and as we begin to look at this, we see that David was looking. For one of Jonathan's, uh, for for Jonathan's sake, he was looking for someone of the house of Saul. You know, by this time, if you were to go back and and read the the first part of Second Samuel up to here, we see that Saul and, and all of the other sons that he would have had, there were no other uh, successors, if you will. And it makes sense at this time that the the way things went is when a king was overthrown that all the children, anyone that could lay a claim on the throne, they would have been sought out and their life would have been taken. And we see that that's probably what has taken place. And as you read Second Samuel, the first part there, you see that's what's taken place. But yet we see David remembers his friend Jonathan and for his sake he seeks out someone out of the house of Saul. And we see that he mentions... There is a son, not just a son of Saul, not just a descendant, but a son of your friend Jonathan. Um, and we see, if we were to go back to chapter 4, in verse 4, we'll just notice this. Uh, as, as we read verse 3 there, his son was lame on his feet. And we see how that happened uh, to this young man. And we'll see his name uh, introduced here in 2 Samuel 4, in verse 4. Here it, it reads in Jonathan, and this would have been previous, uh, but before, um, much, many years before uh, what we find in chapter 9, but it says in Jonathan, Saul's son had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five, year old, five years old when the tidings or the news came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass as, he, as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. So here we see uh, how Jonathan's young son, how he became lame, you know, when that news of Saul, the king, he's, he's, he's no longer alive. Jonathan, his son, is no longer alive. The nurse, I, what do you think the reasoning, as I mentioned a while ago, why she was so quick to, to take him up and try to get out of the city in order to 
protect him, to save his life. Because, as I mentioned, as the custom would have been, any of those descendants that would have a claim uh, on that throne, you know, they, they were fearful for their life. But in, in that time of escape, what we see is, is this young man fell somehow. Uh, and when that happened, he became lame. And as we go back to chapter 9, we see here that David is, is looking. He's looking to show this kindness. And what's interesting, if we look at verse 3 uh, specifically, we see that he's looking for someone from the house of Saul, not just so he can be kind, but he can show the kindness of God. We can see God's kindness played out in, in this story uh, of David and Mephibosheth. And as we, we look at this, we're going to notice some other, some other places that we can see uh, where God showed His kindness. Uh, in the Old Testament, we see that time and time again, God's kindness for the nation of Israel was shown because of Abraham and the promise God made to Abraham in thy seed shall all the, uh, the nations be blessed for that promise of the coming Christ uh, in order for that to be carried out through the, the lineage of the Jews. And we see that kindness as God led them out of Egypt. Uh, going all the way back when they were held as slaves in Egypt. It was God and His kindness. He heard them crying out. He sent Moses to be the one to help lead them out of Egypt. Not only there, but as they left Egypt, we see God's kindness with them throughout. He made sure they had plenty to eat. He made sure that they were taken care of, clothes and shoes that wouldn't wear out. God's kindness was shown to the, the children of Israel. And He showed them kindness when He let them enter into the, the land of promise, the promised land, when they took Canaan, uh, going back to uh, the book of Joshua. So we see God's kindness played out throughout the Old Testament, but we also can look and, and see that today He also extends His kindness to us. If we were to look at Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, <clears throat> Luke 19 verse 10, And uh, bear with me, I'll, I'll be turning and, and reading these as well. <clears throat> but in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, we see where, where Luke records and he points out as Jesus is speaking and, and really telling us why He came. Uh, verse 9 there, Jesus said to him, This day of salvation come to this house for, as much, for so much as He also is the Son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is, to, is come to seek and to save that which is lost. So you, we see God's kindness in the fact that Christ was here. And the reason Christ was here was to look for those. If we think about how that ties into what we read in chapter 9 of 2 Samuel, David, he didn't sit around and wait for one of Saul's heirs to wander up to him. He, he was seeking him out. He was looking for one so that he could honor him and show the kindness of God. And the same way that David sought Mephibosheth. I have to say that slowly. Um, the same way he was seeking him out, we see that Christ came to seek out those that were lost. And we'll notice that a little further as we go through our, our lesson tonight. We see his kindness being shown by the fact that he sent his son to die on the cross. Um, if we were to look at John chapter 16, and very quickly... John chapter 16, not only when Christ was here seeking those that were lost, He also, when He ascended and left the earth, He also left a way for us to seek Him out, to be able to understand His will for us. And in John 16 verse 4, um, here we see Jesus speaking to the apostles, "...but these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you of them. These things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you." As he continues there, he's letting them know, I, I'm, I'm going to have to leave. I'm not going to be with you forever. But when I do leave, when I ascend to heaven, I will send a Comforter, the, the Holy Spirit, to guide you, as we see in verse 13 here, that Spirit of truth, the Comforter, when He has come, He will guide you unto all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but uh, whatsoever, he, uh, whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So that promise of the Holy Spirit to guide the apostles, 
to remind them of the things that they had seen when they were with Christ, to be able to call to memory without having to, to prepare for that, and, and to be able to record that in God's Word that we have today. And, and that's something that we have. God's kindness is extended to us because we have His will in His Word. And, and we see that just as Jonathan's kindness was extended. He didn't have to do that. But when we think of the word mercy and, and, and really what that means, it, it's something that we truly don't deserve. It goes kind of hand in hand with the idea of grace, but mercy is, is receiving something that we really have no claim to. Um, and, and when we think about it that way, Mephibosheth had no claim to what was going to happen to him. His father was the king. He was not a good king, and he was no longer around. His whole house had been destroyed as far as David knew, and he finds out that there was an heir, um, and we see that he shows that kindness and extends that. We also can see that, and we'll notice in a moment, that kindness that is extended has to be accepted too, right? We have to be open to that. John fourteen fifteen, in respect to what God has done for us, He says, if you love Me, keep My commandments. So if we love that, if we love God, we're going to do what He commands us to do. And we find that in His Word. Going back to 2 Samuel chapter 9, and uh, I'm going to do my best not to go too long, not be long-winded. So uh, as we go back to 2 Samuel chapter 9, and we look at verses 4 through 8, not only do we see that kindness that was extended, but in verse 3, there at the end, as Ziba was telling David about this son, he, he pointed out he's lame. He's lame on his feet. He's, he's, yes, he, he can be a servant of yours, but he's really not in a condition that he can help you out a whole lot. That didn't matter to David because as we look at verses 4 through 8, we, we see David's attitude toward that. Even though there was nothing that Mephibosheth could really provide or give to David, David still showed that kindness to him. And the king said to him, verse 4, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Behold, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, and Lodabar. Then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father. And thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant, that thou, should look, thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as am I? As we see... This part of our story, um, we can see as, as David was looking for that one to show kindness, we see that he finds out that Mephibosheth has some issues. He, he's crippled. He's not completely whole. He's not in a healthy condition. But what do we see David's response? It, it didn't matter to him. He still sought after him. He wanted him to be a part of his household, as we see in, in verse 7, and, and to eat at his table um, because we see again him seeking after. Where is he? Where is this one? He sends a servant to fetch him and then he says, I will show you kindness. You can imagine how Meph Mephibosheth would have felt at this point being called before the king. He would have been in hiding all this time. David didn't even know he was out there. Putting yourself in his shoes, you can imagine he was probably expecting to go and, and face his death, right? Because again, what, what do you see taking place in, in those types of, of hierarchies where there's a king? And again, the, the previous king, was his whole family was gone as far as everyone knew, except you. And now you're called before that king. He probably, uh, we can understand why in verse 6 that he fell on his face. And, and he... As it says, he, he did reverence. He showed reverence to uh, that, that fear toward David, respectful fear. But imagine how he felt when he heard the words of David. Behold, uh, 
Fear not, for I will show you kindness for your father's sake. Probably was a load off all of a sudden. I, he, I'm sure Mephibosheth was probably all right, I'm good then. Back to life as normal. But as we see the continuation of it, it's not just I'm going to show you kindness by letting you live. I'm going to show you kindness by bringing you into my house. I'm going to let you come and, and gather around my table. Not just that, I'm going to restore everything that was your grandfather saw, all the lands, all those servants, they're yours again. So Mephibosheth goes from being one in hiding, probably in a pretty bad state, being uh, crippled and unable to, to, to work, being lame. Uh, I'm sure he didn't have a whole lot of, of abundance. And now all of a sudden, everything that was the former king's is, is suddenly his again. It belongs to him. And not just that, he's invited to, to be there and to stay at the table of the current king. You know, as we think about this and how does that show God's kindness to us today, we go and, and as we began in Romans chapter 6, actually, let's go to Romans 3.23. All have sinned, right? We all face sin. We can go back to Genesis chapter 3 and see that, that when sin entered this world, uh, no longer did God commune with Adam and Eve there in the garden. He, he didn't walk with them anymore and, and talk with them the same way they were separated because when sin entered the world, death entered the world. Not just spirit, uh, physical death. We know they were separated from that tree of life, but also spiritual death. Without God's kindness, and even in that picture going back to Genesis 3, when, when God calls them out, if you will, He begins to hand out the consequences of their sin. He, he begins with the serpent, with Satan, right? And the very first consequence that's handed out is, is toward the very one that is trying to do away with us and our relationship with God, that of Satan. And, and we see the promise that's given, you know, the serpent, you're going to crawl on your belly, but then we see that prophecy in verse 15 uh, regarding that of Christ and Satan. Just very quickly, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That prophecy of the coming of Christ that would deliver that death blow to Satan upon the cross. And as we, we see that and we think about that, we see sin and without uh, how God's kindness at the very beginning when those consequences were handed out, the first thing He mentions is a way for us to be reconciled back to Him. Even though the, the picture may not have been clear at the time, but looking back and understanding what the Bible teaches, that, that's a promise that Christ is going to take care of. Sin. He's going to take care of death, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. When that's overcome, then, then we will be forever with that of God. But again, in that state, God's kindness was shown to us. We know sin separates us from God. And in our sins, we're just as Mephibosheth. We really can't do much for the king when we have sin in our life, can we? And as we see that, Mephibosheth, we see really David's mercy and grace extended to him by bringing him into his house, his household, and making him as one of his sons. We see another picture of that in, in, uh, in the Old Testament. If you were to look at Numbers 21, verses 8 and 9, and, and another picture of God's, uh, how He cares for His people, even when they're in sin. Uh, Numbers 21, you may remember uh, just very quickly how... Uh, the Israelites continued, uh, or not 21, yes, 21, verses 8 and 9, beginning in verse, verse 4, how uh, they began to, to murmur and complain, and, and they spoke against God, verse 5, we see the sin there in, in Numbers 21, and you remember God sent the fiery serpents, the, the poisonous snakes in, in and amongst the camp, and, and the people that were bit, they, they, they were pretty much destined to die when, when they were bit by these fiery serpents. And remember, we see that was the consequence of their sin. But then we see Moses 
going as he often did, uh, interceding between the people and God. And, and he points out in verse 7, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee, praying the Lord. That, or the people are asking for, for Moses to make the intercession. Uh, Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents. And Moses prayed for the people. We see him making that intercession to God. And then verses 8 and 9, we, we see that there is a solution. And, and again, they're in their sin. They go, God, I mean, they're getting what they deserve, right? But God has mercy upon them because of, of Moses going and, and praying on behalf of the people. And he says in verse 8 uh, there of Numbers 21, The Lord said to Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it on a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that's bitten, when he looks upon it, shall live. Moses made a serpent of brass, put it on a pole, and it came to pass that if a certain a serpent had bitten any man when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. So here we see a solution to their problem. But again, the kindness of God, even though they were getting what they deserved, when we put ourselves in that same condition, when we find ourselves in sin, really the consequence of that is, and what we truly deserve, justice and God being just, is... It's separation. It's death, spiritual death for eternity. But we see God's mercy. We see His kindness being extended to us in that, again, as we noticed, He sent His Son. He sent a way for us to be reconciled with Him just as He did here in Numbers 21. And incidentally, we'll notice in a moment, this is really just a foreshadowing of Christ on the cross in John chapter 3, verse 14. But today, again, we ourselves... While we're in our sins, we see that Christ uh, came and died for us. In Romans chapter 5, we'll just turn there quickly. Romans chapter 5, and starting in, uh, not 5, yes, Romans 5 verse 8. Starting there in in verse 6, we'll start in 6 and go through 8. Uh, For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Again, that picture of being without strength. Think of Mephibosheth being lame. There there was not as much that he could do with his legs, right? He he wasn't very profitable for David, but yet David's kindness was shown to him, the kindness of God through David. Verse 7 here, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But here we see in verse 8, But God commendeth commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We see God's kindness, don't we? We see His his mercy uh, allowing us a way to reconcile with Him the grace and mercy. Remember, justice requires our death when we're in sin. But because of, of God's mercy and grace, um, and I have jotted down in the, in the front of my Bible in, in relation to these three words, justice is, is one getting, or getting the punishment that one deserves. Mercy is not getting the punishment one deserves. And grace is getting what one does not deserve, if you think about it that way. So mercy being extended, we don't get that punishment we deserve because of God's grace, because He has given us something we don't deserve, and that's His Son. And all we have to do, as we've already noticed, is if we love Him, keep His commandments. Be obedient unto God. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I mentioned John 3 a moment ago. Um, just mentioned verse uh, 14 and 15, but uh, the, the main passage to, to think about here. Uh, in this point is John 3.16, but it kind of lines up with, uh, again, what we, we noticed there in Numbers uh, chapter 21. But John 3.14, John writing here, he goes back and he's thinking about Numbers 21. He's thinking about what we read about a few moments ago. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That kindness of God. That whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Again, just as, as that serpent was upon that pole, when that person was bit, all he had to do was believe that if he looked at that serpent, he was fine, right? No, he had to actually 
stand up, go to the tent door if he was in the tent, and, and make that effort to look. You know, he had to look at the serpent. He couldn't open the door and look the other way. That would have done him no good. No matter how much he believed that if I look at it, it's going to save me, and he chose not to, it's not going to save him. And the, the same is true. We, we have Christ. We see, and we can believe everything we read in the Bible about Christ, but if we aren't obedient to it, if we don't do His commandments, do we truly love Him? As we, we noticed a few moments ago. So as we see this part, even though Mephibosheth was not profitable, I guess, is a way to think about it to David in any way, we still see that he cared enough about him to extend that kindness. And now we'll, we'll go back and look, look at the last uh, five verses here in 2 Samuel chapter 9, and uh, then we'll, we'll begin to, to wrap it up tonight. But here in 2 Samuel 9, going back there, the last five, verse 9 through 13, so here we go. Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in fruits, that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. So again... Mephibosheth goes from hiding out where no one knows where he's at except evidently, you know, Ziba, uh, which was uh, Saul's servant, uh, to having not only uh, Ziba, that was Saul's servant under him, but his 15 sons and those other 20 servants. They, they were given the, the charge there to take care of that land. They were already there doing that. But David is pointing out it's, it's not yours. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to Mephibosheth because he is the rightful heir to that and that kindness that David showed. Um, but he points out that you're going to do that. You're going to make sure there's plenty. That he always has bread, but he's going to always eat at my table as we see there in verse, uh, verse 10. Verse 11, Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. Not just eat at my table, but just as if you're one of my very own sons. And I was thinking earlier, what would it have been like to, to grow up around that table? And to hear David, you know, how little kids are. Well, what about Uncle Mephibosheth there? You know, that's probably how we would, we would carry on with him. And to hear David talk about it, Jonathan, you know, his father, and telling his young sons as they were growing up uh, the stories uh, that uh, pertain between them and, and how that would have been and the memory of that by having Mephibosheth there just as one of his sons. In verse 12, uh, And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. So again, as we see this chapter kind of coming to an end, you know, David not only uh, allows him to have those things, but he makes sure that, that the servants know their place. You know, this, this isn't yours, it's Mephibosheth. You're under him. But he also made sure that they knew he would be, they, Mephibosheth would be there at his very own table will be treated like his son. How does that pertain to us? And the kindness of God, as we, we look and, and go back, uh, we already mentioned in the Old Testament how God showed His kindness to that of Israel, but not only that, we see that when they came out of Egypt, from the very first day, was God not with them? As that pillar of fire, uh, that, that pillar of cloud in, in the day, pillar of fire at night. He was always with them. And later on we see that as they were, uh, even, even though again the Israelites failed to, to do all and, and trust God and, and they weren't able to enter the promised land there when they first came out of Egypt. Remember they had to wander around the, the wilderness. During that time, God gave them instructions on how to build a tabernacle. That tabernacle that was in the midst of the camp was where God would dwell with His people. 
So we see that even in the Old Testament, we have examples of God's people dwelling uh, with, uh, with Him, and Him dwelling with His people. Today, we see that God also, through His kindness, has a safe place, a place of safety where He dwells with us, and that, that's His church. God is here uh, in His church. He gives us a place in which to live. If we were to, to turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, in verse 9, we'll, we'll notice that, that there's a difference between God's people because He, should, he dwells with us and, and the rest of the world. And in 1 Peter 2, verse 9, it says, But ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Again, that idea of being a, a, a chosen people, a royal priesthood. They would have understood the importance of being that priesthood. As, as Christians, we are the priesthood. We, we are God's priesthood in, in the church. We are able to go and, and to make our petitions known to God that only priests could do that. Now, that were things that, uh, the, as those sacrifices were offered, it had to be done by priests. We are, are priests under the new law as Christians and children of God. So we see that He has given us a place to live. He's called us out to be separate from the world. And for that, we are His peculiar people, His special people. We're separate. We're different than the world. Just as we think of Mephibosheth, not just anybody was invited to get to, to sit around the table of the king, was he? Unless you were immediate family, you, you probably might get invited on special occasions if you were fortunate enough to be called. But here's Mephibosheth who continually ate at the king's table. He continually was there with, with the king. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, as we think again, continuing to think about the kindness of God and how that's shown to us, um, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, here we, we read, "...who, speaking of Christ, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, or transferred or transplanted, I think, is, is kind of the idea to be taken up from one location and put into another. Kind of like Mephibosheth, wasn't it? He was taken out of that place he was at, um, and, and Lodabar, and, and he was placed there around the king's table. Uh, we see that, that God, in the same way, uh, when we obey the gospel, when we do what He uh, expects of us to, to become His children, no longer are we in that place of darkness as we see here. He delivers us from that, from that power of darkness and transfers us into His kingdom, the kingdom of His dear Son. We know the kingdom there is referring to the church as well. We're no longer like we once were. We're no longer in need and, and lacking those things that separates us from God because when we obey that gospel, that blood of Christ washes those sins away. We are put Him on in baptism as we are baptized into Christ, which is the church, and Colossians 1 8, and other places tell us that, that Christ being the head of the church, the body being the church. Um, and when we understand that, we can see that picture uh, of God's kindness toward his children, toward us. He's moved us from that place that was bad into that wonderful place where we have fellowship with God. We have all that we need, and we can see that in Ephesians chapter 1, right? Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Uh, it's probably a verse we're all familiar with. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And in heavenly places it is referring, I think, later on, as you'll see in, uh, throughout Ephesians, referring to that of the church. When we find ourselves in, in the church in Christ there, we have those spiritual blessings. No longer are we in that world of darkness, but we've been transferred around that table of Christ. If you continue here in, in Ephesians chapter 1, um, this will be our last, uh, last idea here. Uh, but we see that uh, verses 4 and 5, according as He hath chosen us 
before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. We see that just as, in a sense, David adopted that of Mephibosheth. He sat around the table just as one of his own children. When we find ourselves in Christ, we are adopted to that of Christ. God extends that to us. Once we were children of the world, but no longer. We've been adopted. We are children of God. He's chosen us and taken us in. He chose us in that, as we notice here, that idea of those that are predestined. He's talking about the church there. Those that find themselves in the church, if you're, you obey the gospel, you're part of that. That's predestined. It's not an individual thing. You're in, you're out, you're in. It doesn't work like that. Those that are in Christ are the ones that are predestined. And we find the Bible tells us how to get into Christ is through uh, obedience to the gospel and putting Him on in baptism. Once we were in that world of darkness, but no longer. And uh, we are able to sit around that table and, and eat at the table, if you will, continually because we're part of that family. And we kind of see a picture of that in Matthew 22. Um, I think Keith is, is right around this chapter. Um, but we see the parable of that marriage feast where those that were outside were invited in to the feast and, and they, as long as they had the right garment on, they were, they were able to stay there. And the idea there is the proper garment. If we haven't put Christ on, then we're not going to be able to stay in that, that feast, that wedding feast. Um, but again, as we, we go back and we think about the lesson here that we see out of Second Samuel chapter 9, we see God's kindness bestowed upon one that was without, one that really there was no benefit to the king by doing this to Mephibosheth other than him honoring uh, the memory of his friend, Jonathan. As we see that, we can put ourselves in his shoes, can't we? Uh, we can understand what God has done for us as we were just as Mephibosheth. Without God, we were useless. Uh, we, we were uh, going through this world without very much hope but when we find ourselves in Christ, then uh, we, we see just as Mephibosheth, we're invited to sit around that table to, to have that fellowship with God and with our other brothers and sisters. Now, hopefully uh, this evening we uh, have been able to see some things and, and take some things. Uh, just very quickly, all these things God provides for us and does for us, we still must have that attitude of Mephibosheth, right? Remember in verse 6 when he came to David and he called him by name and I'm your servant? That's the attitude we have to have just as Mephibosheth had toward David. We must understand we now, when we find ourselves in Christ, no longer do we serve sin. We're free to sin. We're free from sin. Now we're servants of God. You see, Romans chapter 6 is, is interesting. It points out that we're, we're servants and we're free all the time. Either we serve sin. If we serve sin, we're free to Christ. If we serve Christ, then we're freed from that bondage of sin. There's no in-between. It's one or the other. And we have to understand that and remember that. And that's a whole other lesson. But uh, hopefully uh, tonight there, these are some things that uh, will help us out as we, we strive to, to live as we should. I appreciate your time and went a little longer than I meant to. So uh, thank you.
Good evening, everyone. Good evening. We're still uh, going to be in the books for tonight. So if you want to go ahead and mark the invitation song for after the devotional, that's 424. The invitation song, if you want to mark that, it's 424. That's Hark the Gentle Voice. So 424 for the invitation. The song that we'll go ahead and sing before devotional will be number 77. 77, Anywhere But Jesus. And if you're able, would you please stand with me as we sing? Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere he leads me in this world below. Anywhere without him, dearest choice would fade. Anywhere with Jesus I am not afraid. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus over land and sea, telling souls in darkness of salvation free. Good evening. If you want, you can turn to Isaiah chapter 59, 1 through 2. We're going to look at that in just a few moments. Um, I want us to picture in our minds, and this is going to sound a little crazy, but you'll, you'll, you'll see what I'm getting at here. I want us to picture in our minds the most horrible, disgusting thing you can think of that would gross you out. Just leave that in your mind, in the back of your mind, either by taste, smell, or sight, or touch. Now, obviously, that might widely vary among all of us, among each other and every one of us. Just keep that in the back of your mind. In the Old Testament, there is an analogy between uncleanness and sin. Back in the Old Testament, we can go to the account of Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. And here he quotes this, Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. God had given instructions back in Exodus chapter 30, verse 9, about that. And Nadab and Abihu violated that commandment. You shall not offer strange incense on it, meaning the altar of incense is what he's talking about, or a burnt offering or a grain offering, nor shall you pour a drink offering on it. It wasn't long after that, after chapter 10 there, that, that after this incident, that God begins his rulings on what is clean and unclean in chapter 11, such as unclean animals, rituals, after childbirth, leprosy, bodily discharges, etc. The idea with all, the, all of this was to get the Jewish people to realize that whatever is not compatible with holiness, in other words, apart, separate, sanctified, and has contact between the two would result in disaster for the unclean. And this is all mentioned in Leviticus chapter 7, uh, 20 to 21, Leviticus chapter 10, 1 through 3, and Leviticus chapter 22, verse 3, and Leviticus 11. These rules are reiterated in Numbers 5, 2, and Deuteronomy 14. 
we see the great importance that this was. It's, it's very important. Now, Cade, uh, a few months ago, dis discussed a little bit uh, on the uh, sermon on uh, clean, uh, clean and unclean, the idea of how that worked. And uh, it's important to understand some of these verses at that time that we, we looked at that. There's a reason for some of that. I mentioned earlier that there's an analogy between uncleanness and sin. In Isaiah 64, verse 6, it states, but we are all like an unclean thing and all our, un our righteousness, rather, are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Earlier, I asked you to think of something disgusting, gross to you. Now, let's take a look at Isaiah 59, 1 through 2 now. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save nor his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. Verse 3 goes on to say, For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue has muttered perversity. You can see this, how, how this d develops here. So we see that God himself has something that absolutely disgusts him as well and grows to him. And that item is sin. God looks at sin in the same way that we would look at the most disgusting, nasty thing that there is. And it's very important to understand that because that, that's very serious. When it comes to sin, God doesn't, God doesn't tolerate that. He cannot be a part of that. We are given a formal de definition of sin in James chapter 1, verse 13 to 15. It says here, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So what's the solution? How do we handle that? Well, Romans 5, 6 through 11, for when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So, when you, when you go and buy an item in a store, such as Lowe's, for example, the front of the package often says, assembly required. You have to do something with that. I may have received something, maybe I might have received a, a, a gift, say, at Christmas time, and the person that bought it, bought it at Lowe's, okay? But it won't help me unless I do something what, what is required to do it for it to work. So God has his requirements for us to be able to take advantage of what Christ has given us. And we just got through reading about that. But, but we have to understand that first one must hear God's word, the gospel, in order to get, gain faith. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then one must believe that Jesus is the son of God, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's very important. Then one must repent of their sins, Luke 13, 3 and 5. I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Verse 5, of course, says the same thing. And then one must confess Jesus as the Son of God, Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 to 33. Therefore, whoever confesses me him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. That's what we want to have. But whoever denies me before men, in other words, if you're, if you're uh, ashamed of that, uh, before, him, uh, before men, him I will also de deny before my Father who is in heaven. Then we, one must be baptized for the remission of sins. So in other words, that which is disgusting to God can be cleansed away. 1 Peter 3.21 says there's also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Finally, one must live a faithful life, even if it means to die for it. Revelation 2.10 says uh, in the second part of the verse, 
Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now, this, all this is for the one that's never obeyed the gospel. But some may have already done these things and have fallen away. One can still have a penitent heart and ask God to forgive that person, and Christ's blood will cleanse that person so that they won't have that, that sin that was disgusting in the eyes of God. 1 John 1, 7, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. It's also possible, perhaps, you might have a need of prayers from your brethren on, behalf, on your behalf. Um, and we're, we'd be glad to help you out in any way that we can, uh, even have a Bible study. For, for If you've never been a Christian, we'd be glad to do that. You can come to the front, and we'd be glad to, to do that as we sing the invitation song. have just a few announcements and just a moment after uh, the announcements we'll have a closing song and then ask um, David Webster if he would to lead us in our closing prayer. Uh, everyone try, try to travel, travel safely tonight. It sounds a little windy and rainy out there. A um, few updates to the news and notes for the midweek um, and they are uh, to keep in your prayers uh, Judy Morgan. She is in the hospital in Birmingham and this is a friend of Jan Barrett's. Also, pray for Cheryl Hall, who was taken to the hospital today. Additionally, uh, pray for those who are listed as sick and shut-ins and those who are battling different illnesses. Um, pick up a news and notes for all of those. Tonight, we especially want to express um, sympathy to, to Ginger Kelly and the Kelly family and the pass, passing of our brother Haskell. The funeral service will be held here at the building on Saturday, April 27th at 2 p.m., and the church will provide a meal following the funeral. Uh, prime timers are going to meet tomorrow night at 6 p.m. The menu is breakfast items and breakfast casseroles. Uh, just really want to emphasize the fact that we have the area-wide singing. We're hosting it. A lot of folks travel to these uh, around the state, and uh, it's one of the things that's great about living in this part of Alabama. We didn't have this sort of thing in Indiana where I grew up, uh, and it's a, it's a tradition of Churches of Christ uh, in this area that we hope continues on for a long, long time. So if you can make it, bring some friends, bring family members, invite your neighbors. This is a great opportunity for people to hear and be encouraged by and sing along with some really, really great spiritual songs. 
Um, that begins at 7, and it will last till 9, and there are refreshments that will be served after the singing. The area-wide youth devotional this Sunday for the month of April will be at Logan Martin over in Pell City. The bus will leave at 345 for that. Uh, they'll have their meal like we did before their 6 o'clock service, so that's why we're leaving then, so we can be there at 5 for the meal. Um, also not mentioned in news and notes, this is for college students and adopted parents of college students. Remember, um, uh, this is a new announcement for many of you. On April 20th, that's about a week and a half away, uh, we'd like to have from 6 to 8 p.m. on Saturday, April 20th, uh, a adopted JCSC students and families potluck. So uh, parents, uh, we don't want the kids to have to make the potluck, so if you can bring a dish or two uh, to make that an exciting time for them, um, it's probably going to be the last time for you to get with that, that student. And so uh, if at all possible, let's, let's all try to be there uh, if you have adopted a JCSC student um, on Saturday, April 20th from 6 to 8 p.m. Teacher supply need is green, yellow, and brown, brown and tan cardstock or construction paper. And thank you for supporting that. And then lastly, um, you heard Blake mention this on Sunday. The elders have just decided we want to try to announce this at the beginning of each, each month. You won't hear us say it all the time, but uh, the field ministry. Field ministry is, is uh, as you know, um, uh, a work that we're doing to provide food to kids and their families who are in need. Um, especially food need. Um, so we send them home with food every Friday uh, during the school year. We're caring for usually 20, sometimes a few more students at Pleasant Valley High School. Uh, you can help continue to show uh, the love of God to them by contributing to this work. If you're interested in supporting this work, it always needs assistance. So your, your monthly help would be greatly appreciated if you'd like to participate in that. The summer is coming, meaning we won't be giving them food over the summer, so that would be a great time for us to be able to stock up and to uh, provide to this uh, good work that we're striving to do for the upcoming school year. These are all the announcements I have tonight. Let's go ahead and stand for our closing song and closing prayer. Three hundred and sixty-one. Three hundred and sixty-one. It's in the first verse of Home of the Soul. If for the price we have striven, that our labors are o'er, rest of our souls will be given on the eternal shore. Home of the soul, beautiful home, there we shall rest, never to roam, free from all care, happy and bright. Jesus is there, he is the light of in the storm. Lonely are we, sighing for home, longing for thee. Beautiful home of the ransom beside the crystal sea. Dear Father in heaven, we come before you tonight thankful for this opportunity we've had to come together in the middle of a week and uh, to study another portion of your word and to fellowship with our Christian brothers and sisters. We're thankful for this building that we have to, as a convenient place to um, come together for times like this, even when the weather is not ideal outside. Father, we ask that you be with the many that are on our prayer list and their various uh, sicknesses and trials, Father. We, uh, we ask that you be with them in a way that only you can, but we ask that they'll feel the love that we have for them in their time of need, Father. Father, we're thankful for your grace and your mercy, and we ask that you keep us safe as we leave here tonight and give us the wisdom uh, it takes to handle all the situations that may come our way this week. And thank you most of all for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins. In his name we pray.